continue in an attitude of worship and praise, would you please open your Bibles to Psalm chapter 1. You know, we finished up last week going through 3 John, and we worked our way through 1 John, of course, and then 2 John and 3 John. And, and so we're at this place where we're kind of not in a series, which kind of gives me an opportunity in which to... Uh, um, kind of preach, and I, I thought of uh, this psalm. I've loved this psalm for a long time, and of course when I say this is you know, one of my favorite psalms, or I say I love a psalm, what I mean is I love them all, right? And uh, they're all my favorites. I kind of have a tendency to do that. I love this one. It's the greatest. And then next week you hear that same statement in regards to a different passage. Uh, love the Lord's His Word for sure. And this psalm is, is a wonderful psalm. And how I got here is this you know, how did we, we arrive at Psalm 1? You know, Pastor, we were in Third John last week, and now we're here in, in, in First John. And, and so I'd like to just kind of remind you briefly, uh, when we finished up Third John, there was three characters, if you remember, John had introduced us to last week. And I'll just give you a little synopsis really quick. There was Gaius who was uh, commended by John, right? John said, you know, Gaius is doing a wonderful job. He's, he's got, we talked about Christian hospitality. He's, he's really doing it, right? He has strangers to his house. Right? And for all of us, we're like, what? That's, that's crazy talk. Right? And of course, culturally, we see that uh, that's how they, they functioned, the early church. And, and they, those who would come and travel into the community, and they were looking forward to stay with, with uh, people within the church family. And we don't know for sure. Guys could have been, it, the church could have met at his house, for all we know. And it was just a natural fit for someone to come and stay there. But uh, John commends him uh, for doing that. Right? And he expects that he will continue to go forward in his hospitality. He realizes that, that Gaius is not doing this because he, you know, he's checking a box and because, well, John said so or Jesus said so. And he's not doing it for that. You know, John approaches it with the idea that he's just being a light that shines. He loves the Lord. He's been changed by the Lord. And his motive is to keep going forward. And John treats him that way. He's going to continue to do that. I believe you're going to, get, you're going to do this. So he introduces us to that, to that character, and then he kind of comes to this other character, who's Diotrephes. And if you read that in the Greek, I think it's Diotrephos. I know it sounds really, maybe it sounds a little better. Um, I don't know which, which way six one half does in the other or not. But uh, there's this character, and he, John tells us that, that he is kind of concerned with himself, right? He, he doesn't really want to do anything with John. He doesn't like what John has been teaching. Uh, John has sent messengers to this church. There's interaction happening, and this gentleman has has uh, not allowed them to come into the church, right? He's put them off. And he's just so adamant in this that, that if there's others within this church family who desire to receive John's messengers, uh, he puts them out of the church, right? And I don't know if he just physically grabs them and says, hey, get out, right? Or he locks the door before they show up. I'm not sure how he approached that. Uh, but John uses this word, he, he desires preeminence. You know, in our life group on, on Wednesday night with our young adults, our little handful of, of faithfuls who come on Wednesday night, we we, we kind of go back, we went back through the message and we talked about that. You know, what does preeminence mean? Right? What, what is that really, what does that resonate? You know, this idea of, of being number one. And, and it's interesting because John doesn't rebuke Diotrephus for, for being a, an unbeliever. This is a believer, right? He doesn't say, hey, he's, he's a non-believer because he's dealt in Second John with false teachers. He doesn't do any of that uh, with him. But he does say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring it into light. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and have a conversation, some type of discipline action he's going to do. He doesn't explain that to us. Uh, but we talked about this word preeminence. You know, how, does, how does that come into our lives? How, do, how easy is it for us for our pride to puff up? Right? And, and what was he saying? He was saying, I want, it, I want to do it my way. Right? John is telling us one way, and I don't want that. John's messengers are telling us one way, I don't want that. And those who are in the church who want John's way, I don't want them, and I'm putting them out. Right? That's what he's doing. And so John's going to deal with that. And so we learned, we talked about this idea of how, how easy it is for us to kind of slide into my way is the right way, and your way is the wrong way. And we tend to have a, a closed grip on that. And so he deals with that. But then he comes to the end of the letter, and he introduces another character, and he and doesn't say much about him. Demetrius is his name, and he just says, hey, there's this, this other gentleman, and, and you know what? His, his testimony has come to me. These messengers have told me about him. And his testimony is rooted in the truth. And he says, you know what? Follow him. And there's an important lesson that I, that I hopefully, by God's grace and mercy, I, I communicated, is the idea that, that you and I are influenced Right? We are influenced by, by people. Those we surround ourselves with, uh, we have a tendency to, to emulate those traits, those characters. And a close friend, we tend to laugh like that friend or joke like that friend or walk like that friend because they have influence on us. 
And I thought how, how, how important it is, he's talking about this, the idea of truth, and John has been walking us through all these things. He gives us these three characters, and so I wanted to just take a little bit of a, a, of a Sunday here, well, not a little bit, all of it, to uh, <laughs> push forward this idea of what, what are some Christian characteristics, because I believe all of us at times would say, you know what, I identify, sometimes I see myself here as a diotrephist, sometimes I see myself as a Gaius, and sometimes there's, there's measurements, and how do we move forward in that? I believe the Lord doesn't want us to be uh, okay with where we're at. He's always pushing us forward. Sometimes we don't like that, right? He's like, come on, Lord, be patient. But he is a potter, all right? As Jeremiah says, and Paul brings that right over into Romans 9, he's a potter, and, and he's shaping you, right? And you're not a bowl for common use, as Paul says. You're a bowl meant for royal purposes. And sometimes for us, for, for God to get us from that lump of clay to royal purposes, sometimes he digs those thumbs in pretty hard, doesn't he? He's just up there just working on you, and you're like, you know what? Let's take a break on me, and let's work on this other person. Um, but I think it's good for us. And so I come to this idea, and, and I thought of, of, of Psalms 1 in regards to this idea of how do we take on Christian characteristics. And I, and I uh, uh, titled this message, Successful Christian Character- Characteristics. You know, I've typed that out so many times in my notes. I was like, I'm thinking I should change the title of this. I got tired of typing it. Successful Christian characteristics, you know. Um, but it's true. And even though we're looking at an Old Testament passage, these are, are things that we can see in our lives, that we can apply to our lives. That because, I, let's face it, you come in contact. Uh, where you live, where you work, where you exist in our community, you come in contact with those who have different views, right, on how to make decisions in life. Um, you're going to be, you'll be forced, or sometimes people are going to say, you know, it's okay that you have preeminence. It's not okay. It's not okay for John. It's not okay for Jesus, right? And John goes on to tell us in that letter, imitate what is good, not what is evil. This is why he uses Demetrius. So there's this push, right? Paul often says, follow me as I follow Christ. Notice Epaphroditus. Look at Timothy. Look at these examples, right? Jesus, uh, deny yourself, pick up your cross, follow me. So there's good examples of Scripture that we want to follow. And so even though we're looking at an Old Testament passage here, Psalms 1, uh, I just want to challenge us, right, as we look at this, to implement these things in our lives and, and make good decisions when you come across that. I'm assuming this morning that you're going to go, you know what, there is this conversation I had or this person I know who struggles with these things because this psalmist is going to unfold uh, some truths for us. Uh, so with that in mind, let me read Psalms 1. Uh, this is what it says. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its seasons, whose leaf also shall not wither. And whatever he does shall prosper. The ungodly, here's our contrast, right, are not so. They are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the, godly, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Let me offer a brief prayer. Father, we thank you once again for this time. As we look to your word, I ask, Lord, that the power of your Holy Spirit would open our eyes to the truths of Scripture, that you'd allow us to see, God, our our lives and what you're teaching us. Uh, Help us to be be truthful and honest and help us to grow. Lord, we see in this passage your desire um, to pour out your blessing as we follow after you. So I pray that you would guide us in that. And Lord, as always, I ask that you would take me away that I every eye and thoughts and uh, desire will be fixed upon you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we've come to this passage and we're, we're, we're looking through this idea of making decisions as you make decisions in life and as you uh, come across so many things that you battle and so many different views. And we live in a society that says there's no absolute truth. Maybe you've heard someone absolutely come out and say that, but the, this whole postmodern mind that is in Uh, operation today that says, you know what, there is no such thing as absolutes, right? So right out of the gate, you have this this challenge, right? You're you're to make decisions in this life, and you're to to be a light that shines, and yet you have people around you, maybe some of you know this morning, who have challenged you in regards to your decision-making. You know, there was a story of of a 
um, a, a bank, uh, I forgot who he is, he was a, a, a bank president, there he was, thank you for helping me there, uh, a young bank president who was taking over for the, for the man who was retiring, and so he, he came to him and he asked a few questions and said, hey, what's, what's kind of the key uh, to success here, and how did you go about this long term that you had here, and he said, two words, he told the younger, he said, two words, good decisions. The young man said, well, that's, 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 that's helpful. Good, thank you for that. But, um, you know, how do you know the good from the bad decisions? And the elder said, well, one word, experience. Not being satisfied with that, right? Not having his, his questions fully answered. He kind of said, well, how do, you, how do you gain experience? Isn't that a great question? How did you gain experience through all this? To which the elder said, two words, bad decisions, right? He knew where I was going with that. I used to have a, a, a quote from the famous author unknown in my office at First Baptist. I said, learn from the mistakes of others because you can't live long enough to make them all yourself. <laughs> right? We learn from bad decisions. And as we come into this passage this morning, there are, there's three things that, that jump out to me that I want to impress upon you for, for us to make good decisions. What are the ways in which the Lord blesses? Because that is what it, the, the psalmist tells us. Blessed is this person. Blessed is this man who does not these things, however, does these things, and then he contrasts it, right, with those who are ungodly. That's, those are the three points of this psalm. And so I want to give us some, some insight into this and, and encourage you, challenge you uh, to, to be um, good decision makers, right, to assess the world biblically and look through it through, through uh, um, a biblical paradigm. And so my first, my first challenge and, and insight, my first successful Christian characteristic is a person um, who is blessed by God is a person who uh, walks on the righteous path, right? We walk on the righteous path. And I did this as opposed to, even though we're going to walk through some negatives here, I, I phrased my point in a positive way, right? The, the psalmist is going to say what not to do and through this point, but I'm going to say here's what you should be doing. It's not just not doing this, but we should be doing this, right? Following after the righteous path. He says in verse 1, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinner, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, right? And so there's three things he lists here. There's three negatives that we should not be doing, Right? He comes out and says, blessed is this person. If you want to be blessed, I think all of us would say, yes, I want God's blessings. Well, here, guess what? Here's what we should not be doing. So the first one is we should not be walking in the counsel of the ungodly. Right? We should not be walking in the counsel of the ungodly. Don't do this. Right? The word ungodly simply means a wicked person or a morally um, wrong person. Right? So don't, don't think of this you know, some type of like sadist or Satanist or something like that, although that's true. Uh, the psalmist kind of has this idea that this is probably more people you interact with. You come around or just aren't you know, morally, morally in line with the culture right? Not of, of Christianity. And he says you need to watch out for this. We want to make sure that we don't uh, walk in their counsel. Right? We don't want to receive this kind of counsel. And so the question for us this morning is how do we discern this? Right? I assume we want to be blessed. Well, how do we discern this? And here's a few ways that I think we should look at and maybe navigate um, you know, our society and the things we come across. The first one is you know, a person who has ungodly counsel, and maybe you've, you've seen this, is a person who denies the sufficiency of Scripture. Right? Doesn't these, these questions pop out from Scripture quite, clearly, quite quickly and clearly when Jesus says, who do you say that I am? Right? Well, if he's a good guy, you kind of know where they stand. Right? We believe all of Scripture teaches. And so if someone comes to you and says, look, um, um, I know you're making some decisions here, but I don't know why you are looking to the Bible for help. Right? We believe as followers of Christ that the Bible uh, equips us, that every word is God-ordained, God-breathed, right? for instruction, for reproach, right? for growth and doctrine. We believe that wholeheartedly. So if you come across some counsel that says, why are you looking to Scripture? That should be a, a flag going off or maybe a bell going off or a flag and a bell going off in your head, right? That's not right. We want to come to Scripture. We want to read Scripture. What does the Bible say about this? And I want to submit to this and go forward. We believe I, wholeheartedly, I'm sure you do the same, that the Bible teaches, provides answers to life's most difficult questions, from marriage to children raising to finances, on and on and on, right, to ethical decisions, the life and death decisions. All these things are contained in Scripture the Bible has insight for us. So if we come to a place where someone says the, the, the Bible is insufficient, 
And usually that's rooted in this idea that there are no absolute truths. The person's kind of operating from that paradigm. And if they're saying that, that should be a flag for you to go, no, I think the Bible has some answers for me. And the psalmist would say, avoid that counsel, right? And if you receive it and hear it, we'll definitely weigh it against Scripture. So they usually, the ungodly counsel denies the sufficiency of Scripture. The second thing I see here is that uh, typically this counsel exalts, right? Our pride exalts the pride of man. And it's going to do the opposite for the glory of God. It's going to belittle God, right? You're the most important. Why are you even considering the idea that there is a God, right? Uh, and if it's a follower, it's a believer, maybe they say, well, yes, I know we want to consider God, but really you've got to do this. And of course, there's some discernment in there, but we have to realize and understand um, that the Bible really goes after our pride. The cross really goes after our pride, doesn't it? There is nothing in which I can add to my salvation. We believe wholeheartedly this work is done by Christ and Him alone. Right? There's nothing I bring to this wonderful exchange. I, I do give Christ all my, all my sin and my guilt. Right, That's, I impute it to Him, and He imputes to me His perfect righteousness, but that really goes after my pride. So we can see that if someone is giving you counsel that says, you know what, there is, um, um, you know, let's, let's focus on you and let's, let's belittle the fact that God has an answer. Let's belittle uh, his glory. This should be an indicator. We know from Scripture, Isaiah 42, let's quote this one, 42.8. Uh, the Lord says through Isaiah, I am the Lord. That is my name and my glory I will not give to another. We think of Paul in 1 Corinthians 1, where he talks about, right, salvation. God is not going to share it. There's not going to be a moment where we stand in eternity and we say, you know what, I'm here because I did something. No, I'm here, right, in eternity before the, the face of God, right? We all get to heaven. It's because Christ has done everything. And so we want to be sure when we receive counsel that we don't uh, take in the world's idea that focuses on self and tries to get rid of God or minimize God. So be aware of that. I'm sure you've come in contact with those who may think this way. You know, not meaning ill will towards you, but just have this uh, paradigm. The third thing I see is this counsel and godly counsel denies uh, or minimizes the need for the cross of Christ, right? That kind of goes without saying, doesn't it? If we're typically good people and, and uh, no one has sinned or fallen short of the glory of God, if we've gotten rid of the Bible, well, then we kind of don't need a Savior anymore. Right? We're, pre we're pretty good, and, and if Jesus just came, I've, you know, I think I shared about an article that talked about Jesus just coming. He just showed us how to live life. That's why he came. And this whole Christmas season that says, you know, the Savior came that he would go to the cross, well, that's kind of, that's not really what it's all about. Right? And we, we see that. That's in, in written. People are writing those things. I'm sure you're having conversations about it. But we should be aware when our pride puffs up. And the Bible clearly teaches that we are Sinners saved by grace. We are in need, right, of an atoning sacrifice. Think of 1 John chapter 1, right? We've walked through this many times where John says God is light. There's no darkness in him. There's no sin in God, right? And he goes on to say, if there is, someone says they, they have no sin, they make God to be a liar, right? Because God sent his son. We have a sin problem. He had to go to the cross. He had to be under the law to fulfill the law. He had to be sinless so he could take upon our sins to fulfill that, right? So we need to know that. If you come across counsel that says, you know what? Uh, you don't really need this whole Jesus thing. You should assess it for what it is. Fourth thing I see here under this first heading, and, and I know this first point is a little longer than my other two, so, so keep that in mind. Uh, then the fourth thing here is uh, ungodly counsel denies really God's moral absolutes. It gets rid of the whole idea of um, the fact that there is absolute universal truth. And that's so popular in our day. It really is. How can you believe this? You know, modernism said, you know, you should elevate your own thinking, your, your rationale above Scripture. You should elevate your experience. That has more uh, power and influence over the fact of, of Scripture than as, as uh, you know, history goes on and we're in this postmodern era, it actually has gotten worse. The idea that there is, don't even bother about elevating yourself. There's nothing to elevate yourself over because there's no truth. I mean, that's our world. That's where you, you exist in the workplace and where we go and we interact. And so it's important. The psalmist says again, right? This person who is blessed by God, if you want a successful Christian characteristic, then understand the counsel that you're receiving. Don't walk, right? This way, walk on a righteous path. Walk after 
God. Imitate what is good, not what is evil. And the last thing here under this, uh, this first point is this godly counsel. Usually always, and it's naturally, this kind of falls to this. It focuses on pleasing self rather than on pleasing God or others. Right? Right away, if you're receiving counsel that says, you know what, it's all about you. It's all about your preeminence. You're receiving bad counsel. Right? Ungodly counsel. Because what do we, what do we see in Scripture? And they asked Jesus, what is the most important command? What is it? How do you summarize it? Jesus said what? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Right? There it is. We see that in Scripture. Jesus is the way, the truthful. Here he is. This is what he says. So the believer's focus is, is, is not, right? Even though we have to care for ourselves, but our focus is on God, on helping others. So when we receive that kind of counsel, it takes discernment. I believe this is why when we see the, the, the examples I mentioned earlier of Gaius and Diotrephus and Demetrius, I just love saying those names. You're going to hear them a thousand times, I think. Uh, we see them in Scripture, but, but the Scripture becomes this wonderful illustration for us, isn't it? Right? Follow after this. You know, don't walk uh, this way. Don't walk. A person who is blessed of God who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. Right? Of the wicked. The psalmist goes on, he says, my second is kind of B under the first point, is we don't stand in the path of sinners. Right? And we're going to see a progression here as this goes on. But we don't want to stand in the path of sinners. Well, what does this mean? Well, it kind of elevates it a little bit more. Now it's just the idea of receiving counsel. Now we're actually um, having involvement right, with someone's way of life, a behavior that is outside or participating in a sinful behavior. The idea of sinners means right to miss the mark here is a person who is missing the mark, the standard of God's word. And, and now we are kind of contemplating and interacting and receiving kind of their views. And so the, the psalmist is saying, look, it's, it's bad enough that if you're on this path, you're walking, but now you're actually conversing here, right? Not in a way where we're evangelizing, but conversing to get insights. We're receiving counsel. It's in that context. So he says, hey, don't, don't do this. And I know in one sense, we are all sinners, Right? We have this idea we are sinners saved by grace. We are in need of the cross of Jesus Christ and the work in our lives. But we realize that once we are saved, our, our, our objective has changed, has it not, right? We are here to see others come to know this Savior, right? And so we interact at a different level with those we come across. Paul challenges us to have in Philippians 2 the mind of Christ, right? Have this mind in you, right? And he says, consider Jesus who left his glory beside. He was obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. And I've said, you know, many times, Paul's using the most profound illustration he could ever, we could ever use, right? And if that illustration doesn't motivate you to look, consider Jesus, to have this mind in you, then I don't know what else there is for you, right? You might want to think about coming and actually knowing him, because I'll probably say you don't know him. And how important it is that the Savior says, you know, I'll set my, my glory aside, I'll come and, and I'll be obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And that's a good thing, right? That's good for us. 1 Corinthians 15, 33 says, Do not be deceived, right? Evil company corrupts good habits. You know, if we think, well, pastor, you know, I've, I'm okay. I can hang out with this group and, and I can keep them lined out. And I'm actually the voice of reason. You have to be very wise, right? Interacting with this kind of counsel, we have to realize that that we can at times take on or emulate. We could have a tendency to compromise. Right? And the psalmist is saying, don't go down this road. Right? Don't walk on this path. Don't stand. Don't interact with them. Right? We see over and over again, I've said this already, we, we want, we're called to imitate what is good, not what is evil. Follow Demetrius, right? Paul saying, look, follow me as I follow Christ. Follow, look at my servant Timothy. What a wonderful example. He does that in Philippians and Pephrodias. So you have all these, these uh, teachings throughout Scripture where we are to emulate what is good and not what is bad. And so we should have and be around, right? That which is good and not bad, right? So we see that. We should not walk this path. We should not stand and then the last one here, he says, do not sit, right, in the seat of the scornful. And here we see the, uh, the progression ever more so, right? It's come to just walking, now we're conversing, and now we actually have a group of people who are sitting around mocking God, right? These kind of include the, the apostate maybe would be in this. These are people who feel they're too smart, 
to believe in, in God, let alone His Word. I don't know, maybe you've come across some of those people or not. Uh, I think it's, it's, uh, um, it's saddening. You know, with, with usually groups like this, they're usually those who have grown up in the church, gotten burned or hurt over something, and they've, they have departed. Um, they put up their, their intellectualism. They, they put it up high and say, this is it. I'm above it. I'm above it all. Whatever wound or hurt that was there, they're, they're not going to, to deal with it properly or squarely, but they're going to say, no, um, I'm going to reject this whole thing. And we, so we see this progression. The psalmist says, if you want to be blessed, here it is. It's not, a, it's not a, a, a one time all of a sudden we're in this place where I'm sitting with others and I'm mocking God. It is a slow fade. Right? There's the insight to verse 1. It doesn't happen overnight. The, I mean, we've heard the, the illustration of how do you boil a frog. Right? Do you get the water going and throw the frog in? No, he jumps out. But if you get him in there when the water's you know, room temperature and you slowly turn it up, chances are really good you're going to boil that frog. Right? Now, I don't know if anyone's ever done that, boil a frog, but um, that's the illustration. Right? We'll just leave that at that. Um, but this is what the psalmist is saying. See, step one is the idea that, that you're walking and now you're walking in the wrong direction. You know, step two is now I'm conversing and I'm hanging out with these people. Step three, I've allowed their, their, their conversation to lead me to a place where now I'm sitting and I'm going, yeah, these Christians are a little, they're a little kooky. There's something wrong with them. Right? It doesn't happen overnight. It is a slow fade. So look at this. First he says, we walk, sta- stand, sit. First you walk. Right? You're moving in the wrong direction. Next you stand. You're lingering in sin. You're contemplating it. You're, you're thinking about it. And finally you sit. You're at ease with those who scorn God. Look at the other progression, uh, ungodly, right? Ungodly, sinners, scornful. First, you're with the ungodly, those who are just kind of don't really care much about God. Next, you're with sinners, those who are kind of uh, have are immoral. They stand against right, God's truth. And finally, now you're with the scornful. You're with those who openly reject. You see the pattern. The next one, he goes for counsel, path, seat. First, you listen to counsel. I took time to listen to what they are saying. It's ungodly, but now I'm, I'm beginning to think the wrong thoughts. Next, we stand in this path and we engage in the wrong behavior. And then lastly, we see we are sitting with them. Once again, we've concluded that they are correct. God's word is wrong. There is a progression. So there's really two lessons out of this first point that I want to drive home with you is that we need to make sure that we guard our mind. Doesn't the scripture tell us that? Renew your mind, right? Renew it. Why is it important? Because you are being influenced every day. Where do you go? And the conversations you have and the paradigm that is so widely presented in movies and social media and in television shows and all these things that have an agenda. I heard a pastor one time say, everything is edited. Just know that, right? Everything you watch is edited. It's presented in a way to to communicate a certain worldview. You and I live in this environment. The psalmist says, look, don't walk that way. Don't contemplate that way. Definitely don't get to a place where you sit and say, you know what? I'm going to endorse these guys. I think they're right. It doesn't happen overnight. It's a slow fade. And so the first steps are very important that you engage your mind. Right? Sometimes we, we Christians think these people are mindless, right? You don't, yeah, they don't even think, look at the world and all this. No, the, the Bible challenges you to think, think logically about the world, and it begins with what? This paradigm that we believe there is truth. We can know it. We can know him. This is my father's world, right? He has orchestrated it. We can't have science without the Bible. You can't have science without a God who created. That's a fact, no matter what they tell you. No matter what atheist it says, we've got to get rid of God, that we can't have science. You can't measure anything without the fact that God has created. Right? But yet we believe that these things are for someone else. Guard your mind. Right? The Bible has answers. Let's, let's utilize that. Second thing is you need to guard your friends. Protect those that, that, that are around you. Help those, but also be aware of those who have influence over you. Who has a right to challenge you to speak into your life? Are they giving you good counsel? Be aware of that. So all this quote from Howard Hendricks, I thought this is wonderful. It says, the two factors which will most influence where you will be 10 years from now. Right? Today's the day. 10 years from now. The two factors will most influence where you will be 10 years from now are the books you read and the friends you make. Such influence over us. Right? What is, what is, what is the input? Are you running what you read, what you see through Scripture? Right? This is the blessed man. This is a man who's on the righteous path. 
So we see the importance of that. This is a successful Christian characteristic. The next one kind of goes right in line with it. Uh, to have a successful Christian characteristic is to build on a solid foundation. Absolutely, right? Build on a solid foundation. Verses 2 and 3. He says, But his delight, this person who's on the righteous path, your delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. What is this person like? Well, he tells us, He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth fruit in its seasons, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. That's good stuff right there. I don't know who you are this morning. That's very good for us, right? We first see the negative. Here's what we should avoid. And now the psalmist says, here's what you should be doing. I broke this down into really kind of two points or sub points rather. The first one is our action, right? Here is the action, what you need to be doing. If I want to be on this righteous path, I want to build a solid foundation. He says, here's the action. Delight and meditate on God's word continually. Therein lies the action, right? There's your answer to that. You know, what's interesting about this is the word delight, uh, if you look this up and study it, it has an, an affection of the, of the inmost heart, according to Encyclopedia. It says, it signifies that which one finds pleasure, the object of one's love. And the idea, I believe, carried with this is um, this idea of, of, of you couples, those who are, who are dating, those who are married, your story. But to use that as an illustration, one of the great things I get to do is, as a pastor, is meet with these, these couples who, who are desiring to get married, and I get to, to hear their story. How is it that you met? Right? And, and it's, it's, they're all good. Right? And they're all over the place, but usually there's this moment. Like, who is that moment? Right? And, and yeah, I didn't, I didn't know Sir Tell then, and it was this. And, and then pretty soon after that, there was all these kind of things we do to make sure that we get to know that person more. Right? All of you have pursued your, your, uh, your spouse, you understand that, right? There is a reason. And I challenge all those I do premarital counseling with to do what? To think on this and remember this story. Right? It's very important because we live in a difficult time and you need to remember why did you get down on one knee? Right? Why, did you pro- why did you seek this girl? Why did, you, why did you pursue after her? And why is it that the other girl said, right? The girl said, yes. Remember those things, Right? Because we delight, we delight in those things. And there's a reason you pursued her. There's a reason you said yes. And this is the idea that, that the psalmist kind of has with the word delight. Do you delight yourself in God's word? Is this something that you are pursuing that you have delight in? And he has this idea of affection. Do you have affection for God's word? Do you delight and pursue it this way? So the question right there is to say, is that you? Does that mark who you are? Am I delighting myself in God's word like I pursued my spouse or a girlfriend, right, of those things? And and am I going after it this way? Where I'm making up excuses to be and to read God's word. Right, many of us would, would you, know, I, you know, in my life, dating my wife, I made sure that you know, I did things that, that included her because I wanted to be with her. So I kind of I made some plans right, to do that. It's the same with God's Word. I remember in junior college, after the Lord called me into ministry, and I had a class that I didn't like the professor. Now, college students, I'm not saying you should do this, but this is what I did. Right? I, I, we're going to this class and going, oh, man, I, can't, I can't suffer through another one of this guy's classes. I'm going to go home and read my Bible. So all I want to do is read my Bible. It was a delight, man. I want to go meet with the Lord. It's never been sterile to me. There's times where I've, I've gone through motions and I catch myself, come out of that, and engage with this living God. Because God has given this wonderful letter. It's a wonderful love letter, right? He sends his son to this world that is broken. That you and I, right, might know him. We might have salvation. And we learn this from Scripture and our action is to delight ourselves in this. Know who he is. He wants to be known, right? And so he tells us to go on, meditate on these things, continually give thought to it day and night. And he's including this idea that, you know, we should be chewing on Scripture. Right? I don't know if you've used that. They use it in Oklahoma. I like it. I grew up with it. My mom was from Oklahoma, right? So we you know, chew on it, right? Digest it and see it grow into application into your life. Maybe there's time we need to start memorizing a passage and saying, what does this mean? And pray about it. There have been times, even recently, where I think about theology and it keeps me awake at night. I think about the wonders of who God is and just how awesome, incredible he is. And yet he called me for some odd reason. He called my name to save me. I just get blown away at this. I delight myself in the Lord. 
This is a person who is blessed. Go after this. Doesn't mean we're perfect, right? But this is our action. The psalmist says, here's your action. Go, go find that he's good. Go that he knows you, right? That he wants to, to know you more. So here's our action. And of course, it, it, it builds to an outcome, right? It's the second part of this. There is an outcome, right? A fruitful, prosperous life. So we see this tree, which is what? It's deliberately cultivated, surrounded by streams, right? Supplied by water. It is solid. It's able to withstand the trials, the difficulties of life. I mean, let's face it, we go through storms, don't we? We go through storms. We go through heartbreak. But we know the Lord is with us, and He grows us, and He allows our roots to go deep. And the tree is also fruitful. It's a fruitful tree, and its leaves do not wither. And He says, this person, right, whatever this person does shall prosper. Now here we... We're not talking about financial prosperity. I mean, that may be the case, but um, we may have this conclusion. Maybe you're here this morning and you say, Pastor, right? this is good. I mean, I, I want to be on the right path. I want to build my life this way, but, you know, I, I, I'm struggling. I'm hurting. I feel like God is, is he's paying more attention to everyone else, and yet I see those I know who don't know you, but it seems like they're prospering. And you may have that, that, that feeling today, and you would look at this passage and say, it doesn't feel like I'm prospering. And see, that kind of naturally leads into this last point. We don't know what all God, God uses to sovereignly refine us. He used a thorn in the side of Paul. Paul didn't like it, but it was good for Paul. He uses hardship and difficulties to refine you. He brings you through valleys so that you know, you know what, who, you know who carried me through that? The Lord. He brings you to that place where you know, beyond shadow of a doubt, the Heavenly Father has held my life. He's given me breath. And so if that's you here this morning, or maybe you're feeling it's for everyone else or not you, this leads into the last point. Because the psalmist wants us to think and to account for eternity. He wants you to say, don't bring it all into perspective. So count this last one, verses 4 through 6. He says, The ungodly are not like this. But they are chaff, which is the, you know, the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in, in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. And so the psalmist contrasts for us the godly and the righteous. He says the righteous, right? They're a sturdy tree. When those storms come and it feels like everyone else is being blessed, you know when that stuff, when that, those things happen, man, you have a, a roots that go deep. The Lord is with you, and yet the wicked are not like that. They have no roots. God's view of your life, he takes into account eternity. He just didn't save you and prosper you for here. No, it's, it's eternity. And the psalmist says, give, give thought to this. We go through difficult times. We walk through difficult things. But this isn't all there is. I love this illustration. I, I think uh, Francis Chan had shared it. Maybe, maybe you've seen it where he has this long rope, goes across the stage, and it coils up all over the place. You can't see the beginning or the end of it. And, and yet he goes and he shares the thing about you know, a little piece of tape on the end of the one side of the rope. And he says, this is your life, Right? And we're concerned with this little, you know, eighth inch in at this moment here and this little piece of tape and the rope goes. And he goes, but that's eternity. It's just wonderful visual where you go, yeah, that's right. And the psalmist is saying, you need to take into account. You know, we may not have what we think we should have, all the prosper things that we should have, but God has given you eternity. He's given you his son. Jesus told us, you'll have trouble in this world simply because of me. You stand for, for truth. You're going to have opposition. But when we gauge and delight ourselves in God's word, he allows us to grow deep. He allows us to be a light that shines. He allows us to encourage others. He allows us to go the extra mile. He allows us to turn the, turn the cheek. And we go through hard times. We have those moments. We start identifying with the apostles. We go, you know what? I always found worthy to suffer for his name. 
Man, I'm going, no, I'm going through all these things. I'm going through, but God is good. And sometimes through, through tears, right, our, our worship happens. Sometimes we're, we feel the brokenness and the weight, and we feel that we're so alone, but we know the tomb is empty. The stone is rolled away. I know he's overcome this world. And there are times where I'm sure you feel like me. I wish all this would end. We'd be with him. And there lies the truth of the blessed person. In the context of this world, I know, and all this goes away. I will see him face to face. What a wonderful characteristic a follower of Jesus Christ has. When you lay your head on your pillow at night, you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that there will be a day of no more tears, no more pain, of no more sorrow. And I know he has my life in his hands and I know that he sustains me and I know that he walks with me. And when I feel the fire that is burning like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I know he stands right next to me. I know he'll never leave me nor forsake me and I know that. And the psalmist is saying, look, you have this This is how you prosper. Nothing takes this ever away from you because it was given to you by this mighty God who loves you dearly. See, the psalmist ends this with with the destinies of two people, doesn't he? There is one destiny that goes this direction. It is like chaff. It just disappears. And there's the destiny of another like a tree that is firmly planted. And he paints this wonderful picture for us. You see, in the end, the, as the Proverbs 14, 12 says, there is a way that seems right to man, but in the end it leads to death. That is the destination of the wicked. And yet for the believer, it is just like uh, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, life. Right? I am it. I have it, and you have it if you have Christ. And he gives us this wonderful promise right at the moment of his ascension into heaven as he challenges us and calls us into the mission field. He says, guess what? Right? I'm going to send you out. I'm going to send you to be missionaries. But guess what? Here's the promise I'm going to give with you. That I will always be with you, even to the end of the age. I will never leave you. I'm going to call you into, into some dark places. I want you to be a light that shines. But guess what? I will be with you. And therein lies this wonderful promise, this wonderful characteristic the world cannot give you, but God can. And so therein lies our motivation, right? Christ, Christ alone. This is why I'm on the righteous path. This is why I want to build my life on a solid foundation. This is why I want to take into account eternity, because there are days where I think he's so far away, but I know my Savior lives. He will never let me What a wonderful truth. What a wonderful resolve in the context of of difficulty and problem. And yet, this wonderful God wants to be known. Delight yourself in him. Know and be sure he has my life.